Uh, my first question is to um, you, Michael, if you could explain how you first were contacted by the men at Attica. When the <coughs> prisoners took over DR, they asked for uh, observers, and one of the observers was William Kunstler, who was uh, a mentor of ours and who was uh, active in the National Lawyers Guild. So uh, we were following the situation leading up to the massacre on the 13th, and when that happened, a call was put out by the National Lawyers Guild uh, for lawyers to come to represent the brothers, both in the pr this expected criminal cases, and there were brothers with bullet wounds and had not gotten mel medical treatment. There were still people being the subject of reprisals and beaten. So a group of lawyers from Chicago and from New York and from Boston and from Detroit all came to uh, Buffalo, which is where we were based, to work on uh, defending the Attica brothers. And uh, it was an experience that really changed my life. I had been active, but seeing what those brothers had gone through and how strong they were and how they committed they were to fighting these charges against them, and uh, it was a very uh, mind-altering experience for me. I mean, just to follow up on that, I'm curious, um, as lawyers, you have um, open access, you both have open access to um, uh, incarcerated people, but what was the conditions of your access to people at Attica given the sort of intense back and forth between the state and them? Well, interestingly, uh, and actually there's a woman here, Mzizi, who uh, was from the People's Law Office at the time, and she and one of my other partners, Jeff Haas, are one of the first people that were led into Attica uh, after they retook the prison. But prior to that, they had gotten a court order from a federal judge, and a, a, a caravan of lawyers went to the prison with this court order to get in. And the, uh, the warden said, no, I don't care about a court order. You can't come in, and sent them back. But ultimately, uh, the lawyers did get in, and we would go in every day. We went in for like 50 days in a row, talking to the prisoners, dealing with their problems, making sure that they were getting medical care, and pr challenging the fact that the leadership was all put in isolation and had been tortured, and then preparing for what we, we considered to be their response of indictments against the leadership and others. Benny, you were in Pontiac State Prison during the riot there, and you were indicted along with other um, incarcerated men for the murder, attempted murder, and mob action. I was wondering if you can explain conditions of the prison at that time and how you were acquitted of those charges. And um, I bring that question up just to talk about how these kinds of um, uprisings were happening in multiple states at that time. Well, yeah, the Pontiac riot was, what, seven years after the Attica riot. And prior to that Pontiac riot in 78, July 22nd, it was a riot in Stateville. And there was another one in Stateville uh, two years before that one. And then it was a riot in Pontiac prior to that one in Stateville. So there was a lot of uprising going on. Uh, when I got to Pontiac, young, gang-affiliated, and brothers was already talking about bad conditions. And in my mind, with a convict mind, I'm like, what you mean condition, man? We in the penitentiary. I didn't have a conscience then. And uh, brothers had been talking about the complaints of the food and uh, you got to practically be bleeding or your head busted to get some medical attention. They, they didn't concern themselves with if you had some internal stuff like a also going, uh, you had asthma, you know, if it wasn't visible, you didn't get treated. And uh, even some of the officers with me make comments about the condition they worked on. You know, uh, one Lieutenant Thomas, who actually got killed in the riot, uh, I got to know him. You know, the little brief, because I was in Pontiac a hot second. I, it wasn't like I was there for years. I come to Pontiac, uh, I think, in the, the last part of June, and the riot happened in July. So, so my co-defendants that I got indicted with, I didn't even know them. 
In fact, a lot of us didn't even know each other. But what we had in common, we were high-ranking members of street gangs. You know, when the riot happened, uh, Governor Thompson came down, and Charles Rowe, who was the director at the time of IDOC, and they stated that the riot was a year late. They had been expecting the riot a year ago. But then when the Illinois Department of Law Enforcement did the investigation, then it became a gang takeover. So we were pretty much scapegoated. And when they hit my cell and told me I was an inst on an institutional transfer, I was like, what a relief to get from out of here. But when I got on that bus and I saw every high-ranking gang leader that was in that prison at the time on the bus, I oh, Lord, we it. And they shipped us straight from Pontiac to Stateville on death row because they had just bought the death penalty back to Illinois in 77. And this was October of 78. And we were housed on death row for maybe a year. And then the indictments came a year later in 79. And I was just in the days when they read those indictments. I, mine seemed like my eyes just fixed right on my name. And I'm wondering why, you know. But uh, it, it was just something, you know, after the riot and they shut it down. We didn't eat for about a week. Uh, they didn't turn the water on. You had to survive from what water was left in your toilet to survive. You know, if you didn't have any commissary or nothing, you didn't have nothing to eat. And then they started snatching brothers out, taking them to the school, uh, interrogating them. Some guys wasn't coming back. Some were coming back, not talking. Uh, I remember I went over there, and, they, and it was real hostile, you know, because they had you by yourself. And uh, maybe a week after I went over, they brought me back over and stripped me down because I got shanked through the riot. You know, a knife went through my arm, and, and I didn't talk about it. And they, so they had to rush me to the doctor because they say gangrene was sitting in my arm, and I might have to cut it off. You know, and a lot of guys that I trusted disappeared. And so everybody felt like a suspect. Everybody wanted to get from under those conditions, and I think that's what you all base your defense on. Uh, you know, expert testimony saying anyone under those conditions would say anything from get out of those conditions. You know, but I don't want to get more on to the trial or nothing like that. But yeah, uh, Pontiac was similar to Attica. Three guards got killed, but we were all charged with 15 counts of murder. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's what it was. A lot of poor conditions that even the officers was complaining that they had to work under. They didn't like working there. You know, and, and it was brewing, and I just came at the right time when it happened. I just want to say there were 17 young black men sh facing the death penalty. It's the largest death penalty case in the history of this country, which was the Pontiac Brothers, which I was also fortunate to be involved in, one of the lawyers. This is my last question, and then we can open it up to the audience. Um, last year, an article came out in the Atlantic by Joseph Bernstein about um, the training of correctional emergency response teams. And um, he wrote about this conference that happens every year in Moundsville, Virginia, officially known as a mock prison riot, where prison disturbances are simulated, new taxes are discussed, and dozens of specialized vendors sell shank-resistant undershirts and suicide-proof dental floss. Um, his article talks about today, compared to the 70s and early 80s, that there are very few prison uprisings, and he um, attributes this perhaps to um, the rise of the correctional emergency response teams. But he asks this question that I think would be useful for us to think about now is that if riots in the past brought up questions of serious mistreatment of people in, who are incarcerated, um, how do currently incarcerated people in your work as lawyers, um, in your work, Benny, um, how do currently incarcerated people um, voice their um, concerns or grieve their mistreatments today? I don't think there's a lot of difference. I mean, the, um, 
the the biggest difference and the and the main difference as far as I know is the that the physical security has been magnified beyond belief. I mean the 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 difference between just the the physical routines and the physical security, I guess the word you have to use at Attica at the time of, that the riot occurred there or the rebellion uh, and and the way all the prisons that have been built since then, which is hundreds across the country, uh, it, it, the, the, the main thought and attention and money has gone into the physical plant, the, the, the locks and the gates and the walls and the surveillance points and the separations where they can keep, you know, they can prevent it physically better than any other way. And at least this is what the energy and the thought and the money has gone into since then. Uh, uh, that's aimed Hello? I'm sorry. Um, you know, that, that, that when they're thinking about it, keeping it from happening again, that's what they're thinking about. And, and because of, I would say, probably both money and politics, uh, and and I'm, 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 I could talk more about California, so I've been there all these years. But they, they gave up on any idea of rehabilitation in a big way all the way across the country. They stopped programs in prisons. They stopped education, or they cut it down, they cut it back. They, there, there was a change of philosophy that was born, I think, in resentment of the riots that, and the rebellions that happened. And, and, and it, it, they did happen all over for a while, but then it got too hard, you know. My take on it is, uh, see, I'm a C number, and you still got some C numbers locked up. A, a C number is a brother that was convicted prior to 1977. So you got guys here in, 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 in Illinois that are still C numbers. They've been locked up before 1977, old oh, man. And when I was in prison, it wasn't but five prisons in Illinois. You know, Joliet is where everybody went through, the diagnostic center. And from there, it determined what prison you go to. At one time, Pontiac Prison was a vocational prison where you go and learn a trade. One man sales. And Stateville was a maximum security joint. And then you had Menard. But you had Vandalia, which was really boot camp, because you went to court on Woods and Augusta, and the judge gave you six months in Vandalia if you were under 21. That was it. Those were all the prisons in Illinois. So when you had the riots in Illinois prisons, they were mainly in Stateville. Because Menard was like a majority white inmate prison. See, when brothers go to Menard, they had to put aside GD, Vice, and become brothers. Because you got them white gangs down in Menard running Menard. And it seemed like that's where they put the rough white guys in Menard and, and black guys in Stateville. So we had time to organize in Stateville because they couldn't ship you around. There wasn't no prison to ship you to. If you got shipped out of Stateville, you end up in Pontiac or Menard, one of the three. So you can settle and organize, and you be there among each other for a while. But when Reagan got in office, and he shut down all the mental hospitals, and now, the, now those mental hospitals are prisons. Dixon Penitentiary was a mental hospital. You know, Logan and all them prisons, those were mental hospitals. So now you got over 20 some odd prisons in Illinois. And so a lot of guys don't want to get shipped downstate. They want to be close to Chicago. And now everything you own got to go in a box. They can, uh, they got a structure where there's no contact with each other, uh, only in small groups. And, and if they see Four, five guys hanging tough regularly. Two might get shipped within a week. And, and, and they put in guys that they believe got influence on the circuit. 
where he transferred from one prison after another. He stayed there no more than 60 days and get shipped to another. So they're breaking up the ability for inmates to come together and communicate and organize. So this is why I believe it, it cut down the, the rioting, what you used to see in the 70s. Uh, I, I can't remember the last. I, I done been in uh, three prison riots in Illinois and maybe four riots in the county jail. But this was all in the 70s. You don't hear about it now. Inmates are passive. And one thing about the passiveness of the inmates, because see, the same thing that we fight for out in our communities, lack of jobs, poor education system and all that, it's the same thing in prison. Stateville got maybe 120 jobs for over 2,000 inmates to fight over. So you fight for the same conditions. And the inmates, at least in Illinois, because that's where I'm from, they're afraid to rebel because they don't trust they had the support of the people in the community. See, back when we was in the Pontiac, when we were the, the Pontiac trial, the community rose up. You know, the black politicians, the black preachers, the community rose up. Brothers in prison now don't feel they'll get that from the community because society has taught uh, the people of society they belong locked up. They should be treated like that. So guys are afraid to rebel because they don't feel they'll get the support out here in the community. Yeah, um, both, thing, both factors that uh, they've mentioned are, are exactly what is going on. First of all, they create these things called control units, which are units where anyone who's politically outspoken or in any way resists is put in a lockdown 24, 23 hours a day, and they could be locked there for years without any reason, way to get out. So anyone that thinks they're going to be organizing or politically active in the prisons, and this is a national phenomenon. Pelican Bay is one of the leading uh, places where they've used control units, where they've had people locked up for 10, 15 years in, in isolation. So they have the power to isolate prisoners. And also, I think if you look at Attica, Attica was a much older population than you see in prisons today. And today, you have really young guys going to prison and having long sentences, and they're not in touch with the community that they come out of. In Attica, you had people who were part of the civil rights movement, who were part of the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, uh, Muslim groups, and they, there was a connection between them and the community. So they were more politically developed and more in touch with the supporters in the community. Today, if you have politically conscious prisoners, they're gonna be isolated and put in special units, and they're, it's gonna be make it very difficult to, them to organize and raise issues in the prison. With that, I think we should see if anyone in the audience has questions. How you doing? Um, my name is Jimmy. Brother, I commend you. Um, I just been released from prison. Um, State Welcome home. Yeah. Stateville, seven years. And in seven years, they wouldn't let me go to school. They wouldn't let me get a job. I couldn't do nothing. They have a new program where if you are considered aggressive or a problem politically they they you, they put you in stripes and in stripes you go you know when you get a visit you're behind a glass you quarantine to a certain house f house where you got nothing but hot heads yes that's the roundhouse i caught diabetes i was sick for 10 months no medical treatment. I wrote people law office, Uptown Law Center, John Howard Association. I filed a lawsuit. Matter of fact, um, excuse me, I'm nervous. I got a hearing September 30th, and I need help.
this is why our organization is set up. I founded the National Alliance for the Empowerment of the Former Incarcerated. And we are all ex-offenders that make up this organization. We have what we call re-entry circles. In fact, we got one tomorrow. You can come and you talk about what you're struggling with. And we give you feedback and support. But we also got a table with resources. We just don't hand you a flyer. We help you make that call. We help advocate for you. If we got to take you down there, because some guys struggle with going in business offices, we coach you through that. And we suggest you choose one of us as a mentor. We're not a nine to five organization. We got a list of mentors that make themselves available to you 24 hours a day. It ain't too much you can talk about you going through that some of us ain't been through, you know. And, and we're trying to start these reentry circles in every community where there's a concentration of people coming out of prison. And once we get in the community and start them up, we try to turn it over to the community so it becomes their circle. You know, we don't have no government grant. A lot of it is volunteer. You know, we got people like Sarah that supports us, you know, uh, the Montgomery Foundation with Cynthia Cobra, you know, we, we don't have no grants. We still find some kind of way to pay the rent. So you're more than welcome to come. I, you might see a brother that then came through Stateville. I know Stateville is different than the Stateville I went through. When I left Stateville, I was in E House, which was a roundhouse. They all tore down now. I went through there, and I didn't recognize Stateville. But I recognized F House, because it was around house but it's different now but yeah uh, we just believe that it, it uh, like iron shop and iron uh, alcoholic can help another alcoholic uh, s con can help another s con so come brother you ain't you ain't got to be alone in what you're doing thanks any other questions I, I was uh, impressed in the video about how much support there was from both the New York Times, Congress people, um, and the commission seemed pretty rigorous in its kind of interrogation of the commission guards. And that was during the Nixon administration. Um, so the prison population is five times now what it was then. And I'm curious from your perspective as activists um, on this issue, um, what what didn't work about that kind of movement at the time that people thought conditions might have changed? And what caused this massive increase? Did it happen simultaneously at a national level and a state level? Was it more from above? Like what went wrong? And what were the main forces that made it so bad today? Well, you're right. In 1972, there was about 200,000 people in state and federal prisons. Today, there's about 2.6 million. And it, it, interestingly, from 1925 to 1972, the rate of incarceration was steady. It never rose. And then in beginning, right after Attica, we had the beginning of this uh, incarceration explosion. And a lot of it had to do with the war on drugs, but it also had to do with a conscious effort to repress the black liberation movement in this country. And it was part of a plan to federalize uh, the, the police. Uh, there was a law, law enforcement uh, agency and millions of dollars were given to local police and local prisons. So after Attica, there was like a, a, a reform effort. You know, people were kind of outraged about uh, what had happened, the conditions in prison, the treatment in prison, what happened at Attica. And there was the creation of a lot of prisoner rights programs in the country. But while that was going on, the major thing was going on was this idea that we're not going to have any more Atticas, we're not going to have any more resistance, we're not going to have any more rebellions in the, in the inner cities, and we're going to use the prisons and the police to repress the black liberation movement and the black community in general. That's my view of why we went from 200,000 to 2.4 million. And uh, 
if there was a whole, the counterintelligence program of the FBI was part of that, the targeting of black leaders. All this was part of a, a process of repressing the black movement. Well, and, and it was, it was a, 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 a political expedient on a broader basis also because you're talking to a difference between 200,000 people and two million people in the population. That's two million people that basically they don't have any room for in the economy. There's no jobs, and there hadn't been, and there won't be, and and that, I mean, it's true that in the last few years, suddenly in many places, they are waking up to how much it costs to keep that many people locked up, and that is maybe undercutting that drive somewhat, but in fact, there was this huge push all across the country and there was a huge, like a wave of political opportunism. It's always good. when something happens, you go to the, in the legislature and beat your chest and demand higher sentences and and uh, uh, more more offenses that you could use to put to lock people up. So that that it's true. I think that the impulse came out of the stuff that had happened in the cities in the, in the sixties. And the and the uh, 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 a very broadly shared political intention to suppress the black movement and to tighten the lid on the black communities, uh, uh, and this was the, the the drug war was the vehicle for it basically, and uh, in, in, in which was a preposterous notion, right? The country just went through prohibition on alcohol and found out not only does it not work, it makes everything much worse, but and prohibition of drugs was immediately embraced for other reasons, and it, and it was implemented through that more than anything. And then when you look at uh, who are they putting in the media as the enemy in this country, you know, it, yeah, it started off as the war on drugs, but then it moved to street gangs control the drugs. And so the street gangs become the enemy. And so it's like uh, when you, you ever seen the untouchables? Who were the untouchables? You may say Elliot Ness. <laughs> but Al Capone and Lucky Luciano, they were the untouchables because they were committing crimes that were not federal offenses, so the feds couldn't touch them. So they were the untouchables. And then they realized that Al Capone was making money, but he wasn't paying taxes. So he went to prison for tax evasion. So then the feds moved to the RICO, racketeering, influence corrupted organization, because they say they were organized crime. And so a lot of their cases became federal cases. And they used that to bring down the American Mafia, the syndicate. Now they're using the same tactics on street gangs. Cases, I remember back in my day, if I get caught with a pistol, I might can get a probation. Today, when you label a gang as a gang member and get caught with a pistol, you might end up with eight years. So the things that back in my day that we used to get away with, these little guys now, once they label a gang member, they gonna get knocked out the box because the world hate gang members because of all these shootings. And they tie that in with the war on drugs and the gangs is the drug dealers. You know, here in uh, Chicago, they, they, they look at Chicago street gangs are the number one buyers of the drugs that come into this country. Because it ain't a state in this country or a big city in this country, you can't see the presence of Chicago street gangs. You go to Mississippi, you're going to see vice lords, disciples, and stones. You go to New York, you go to Michigan, you go to Minnesota. So they targeting Chicago street gangs. Then they come into these communities and say they're high risk, high gang re related areas. So nobody's Fourth Amendment right is honored. That means they can search you without your permission. You know, by law, they can't just go in a woman purse. That's like going to your house without a permit, I mean, without a warrant. But in these communities, they do it and justify it, but it's a high crime rate area. 
And who are they targeting? Young, black, Hispanic gang members. And what are they tied into? They're controlling the drugs. So you see this large. And then who make up the prison population? Here in Illinois, over 70% of your people in Illinois prison are your repeated offenders, nonviolent offenders, drug and alcoholics. That's who's going in and out of prisons in Illinois, right? 65% of those people come from six neighborhoods in Chicago. You know, uh, when you look at uh, the economy, the jobs, the average decent job to pay a decent salary requires a college degree. That's about two-thirds of the jobs. So that leaves one-third of the jobs for people that don't have a high school diploma right, or have a high school diploma. And most convicts come out of prison without a high school diploma or with a high school diploma. So they're in this one-third column. So they're competing against jobs with people that have a high school diploma with no background. And then some of the jobs in that one-third column don't hire convicted felons. So a person come out of prison, they're in a one-tenth column of the jobs that's available in this state. So that's going to bring about a high population of unemployed as cons. And out of desperation, they go back to old means of survival. And that creates this recidivism here, this cycle that we see. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm going to say this in past. You know, it goes back to when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. It wasn't worth nothing. He talking about free the slaves, but the slave owners didn't declare slaves as human beings. They was property. So he couldn't tell them to give up their property. But it passed Congress in 1865. Then it became the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And when you read it, what do it suggest? No person of U.S. citizenship should be subject to slavery or indentured servitude unless otherwise convicted of a crime. Then they came up with these vacancy laws. I mean, if you wasn't working, didn't have a place to stay, that was a crime, and they locked you up. And they came up with this convict leasing system. That stuff's still going on today, but because people are not aware of that history, they can't see it happening today. And so we have a high recidivism rate because I've been out of prison 30 years. But if I went into a Home Depot and they tell me, well, Mr. Lee, we can't hire you because you're a black man, I can sue them for what my forefathers fought for. But if they say, well, we don't hire you because you're gay, I can sue them because the gay community came and fought for their rights. But if they say we don't hire you because you're a convicted felon, I'm unprotected. I was just in Washington, D.C. two months ago with Congressman Danny Davis testifying to the Congressional Black Caucus, me and six other brothers from six other states. And they was asking, what do we think as, as cons that, that what Congress can do to ease our stresses that we deal with coming out of prison? And I, I think it was Barbara Lee, a congressman from uh, Texas or California, California, I, I, I appeal to her that, and even you all to look at me and say, well, you paid your debt to society. But the debt ain't written nowhere. What is the debt? I mean, if the debt is, I serve my time, I complete parole, and the debt is paid, then if you discriminate against me for job or housing because of my background, then that should be grounds for me to sue. But the debt is not written out. So I think Congress needs to put the debt in writing <laughs> or amend the 13th Amendment. Until that happened, any person with a conviction in their background is unprotected and have no rights that no one is bound to risk. Sound like the Jared Scott decision. <laughs> you know, so these are the kind of things that my organization, we deal with trying to raise the awareness of all ex-cons in the state of Illinois. You know, I see my brother back there, all of us are none from California. We part of a national movement called the Former Incarcerated and Convicted People's Movement. This is a national movement of ex-offenders in what, 27 states that come together. Uh, and I'm doing the work here in Illinois, uh, trying to get somebody to step up in Indiana and other states so we could do this mass movement. You know, like they had a million man march. We need to have a million ex-offender march and bring some awareness on how we set up to recidivate because we are barred from certain. And there's, you know there's over 80 licenses in Illinois that I can't apply for because of my conviction. 
over 80 licenses that I, if I decide to open up a business that require a license, I may be denied that license because of my conviction. And I've been out of prison 30 years. A homeowner, a husband, a grandfather, a taxpayer, a professor at a university, but I might not even get a job at a Walmart if I decide to apply for it because they don't hire convicted felons and I have no legislation to support me. Hey, bro. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Um, I'd like to try to put a human face on what we're talking about, people in prison. Uh, I went to prison in 1969 in California, so I was there when some of this stuff kind of was, was, was growing, and I was a member of the Black Panther Party, and that's why I ended up there. But this question of, of prison and, and what's going on in this time of what they call shoes, security housing units, um, and the fact that they've made all these prisons, and people talk about a war on drugs. I never saw a drug in prison behind a cell. So there were some wars on people, and primarily it was the neighborhoods of people of color, and they built these facilities. They are there now. The danger to our young people is that they got to have somebody to put in it now because they got to convince you, the citizen, that the so-called gang members are much worse than the marijuana users. And so you should support and be willing to go into your pocket and bring out whatever amount of money that's necessary to lock people up. They need to fill these places up. One of the reasons or one of the ways that was suppression of the rebellions from my perspective, I never seen a riot, I've seen rebellions. Um, one of the things that they've actually done, and, and you need to know about this because we, this is like some stuff that I learned as a kid when I first heard about Russia. They told all these stories about Russia um, that the real world makes Russia looks like a country of choir, choir children. That what they do in places like Pelican Bay, there's one man who's there and through legislative processes and testimonies and begging and fighting, we've been able to get him out. But his name is Ugo Pinnell. He was one of the San Quentin Six, the people was charged when George was killed. Ugo Pinnell was in one form or another of the whole from 1968 until last year, right? This, I mean, he only asked for one thing. He wanted to see his mother. He wanted to touch his mother again before, he, before she passed. He was fortunately able to do that because we got him out of the shoe into a, a, a regular line. But the important thing to understand about this human part is Ugo Pinnell is in prison for simple assault. In the state of California, if a free person is assaulted by a person with a life top, and we used to have indeterminate sentences, they're sentenced to something called 4500 under penal code. It is more time than if you killed the same person that you assaulted. So he's literally been in the hole for all these years behind the assault of a, of a guard. And there's a lot of people who, pre who, who, who went there before I did that I know who've never gotten out in all this time and who've been eligible for, in one case, one of my comrades has been eligible since 1976, and he's never been released. So what they've done is they've locked up the conscious people. And so they've turned the prison into these places where there's no consciousness. And the young people have no history, and people are turning that aggression on each other, and you're hearing it in the news out here, and believing that people are just some sort of savages. It, it's not so. They're being treated today, not, not back 
back then. It's going on today. It just takes another form. And I just hope people would really keep a human perspective when you hear this stuff. You saw that movie and you saw the families of people who died in that movie who were clear about what really was going on. And, and, and I guess the last thing is I don't view myself as an ex-offender. I'm, I'm presently offended. I'm offended every time I see this stuff that they're doing to human beings. And, um, and I really think it's important to keep the human perspective on this all the time. Because if we get into the labels, they got us. Every time they shoot a young person down in the street, they find marijuana in their system, what do they talk about? They talk about the marijuana, not the dead kid. So let's stay human, folks. And I appreciate so much people would come out and see this film. Thank you very much. Thanks. So we'll take one last question, if that's OK, right here. Thank you. Hello, hi, I am so happy to be here. Um, I'd like to make a comment first and then a question for each person. My name is Rowena and I'm from Selma, Alabama. Um, my father was pastor of First Baptist Church. They were the group that invited King to Selma in 1961 in headquarters of SNCC. My grandfather in 1955 was arrested with 200 ministers when King was arrested in Montgomery during the Montgomery bus boycotts. In our family, from little children, um, we were always made conscious, as much as they knew, I should say, we were middle class family. Uh, so as much as we knew, made conscious problems of people around the world. And you were taught within your own sphere of influence you know, everybody is not an attorney, everybody's not a teacher, everybody's not a doctor. But we all have capabilities, we have skills. I love when I get a, a chance, the opportunity to hear uh, from people who've experienced uh, things to bring it into our conscious, not the experience itself, but their willingness to share it. But where I'm concerned about is sometimes there can be a disconnect between uh, what has happened, and then people seeing how within themselves they can make a difference. Can you share with us what would you like the takeaway? Um, and I'm speaking for myself. I don't know if I'm speaking for anybody else, but what can we do um, just as human beings in the suffering of what you're describing today and countless other sufferings? What would you like the takeaway to be for us in terms of our uh, maybe possible act uh, uh, involvement in this sort of effort and others. Uh, one example uh, in some states, a convicted felon has lost their right to vote forever. In Washington, D.C., it was a case because uh, when they come out of prison, they can't vote for seven years, and then they have to petition for that right back, and it ain't guaranteed they get it. And they took their case all the way to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, and they ruled it because convicted felons are not identified as a class up under the Voting Protection Act that they couldn't rule in their favor, but they recommended that convicted felons move to become identified as a class. And so, It'll take the family members that can't vote to become their voice for those that can't vote to change legislation in those states to get their rights reinstated. It's like here in Illinois, because uh, our convictions, we can't get certain licenses and we can't do certain things because of our convictions. So it's going to take people like you to put pressure on your legislators to change those things. Because if it's, if it's not changed, a person is set up to retreat back to old means of survival out of desperation. And so you keep the recidivism going, you keep the crime going. You know, uh, what I do uh, with my mentors, I got a lot of guys that come to me, want to be a mentor with the organization. And man, you know, I've been to the joint, I could be a good mentor. 
But I'm real strict on who I allow to be mentors with my organization because everybody got a prison story. I'm looking for brothers and sisters who got a reentry story. What have you done since you've been home? Because these little guys ain't impressed because you've been to prison. They're impressed if you've been to prison and you got out and sat in a GED class at 40 years old and got a GED and now you're working and you're taking care of yourself. You know, I'm looking for people who got a reentry story. So when it comes to what people can do that haven't been through what we've been through, it's like get behind us. You know, I know uh, I get pulled on a lot to go in these schools to talk to these young brothers and that's hot-headed, you know, because a lot of these little guys, they done see me on gangland or American Gangster highlighted as a gang leader, and they'll listen. And, and I've got some skills, some training. You know, I know how to do rites of passage. I'm a facilitator, you know, inward journey, all of I've got a lot of disciplines. I can help transform minds and uh, make a young brother or sister see themselves different. And at the same time, see the world a little different and see themselves functioning in the world. But when it comes time for us to get in these uh, institutions to do the work, we run into a block. You got a conviction. We can't let you in here around our kids. But these kids are our sons and nephews that live in the hood with us. <laughs> but we borrowed out to go in an institution where we got their attention. Because, see, uh, 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 Harvard University just did a study, and they came up with a term called hood disease. You know, some people use the term post traumatic stress disorder lightly. You know, like our young people in the inner city are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder only happens once you are removed from the environment or the situation that's life-threatening. And it's months after that you experience post-traumatic stress disorder. But as long as you stay in the environment, you can't experience post-traumatic stress disorder because you're constantly traumatized over and over. And so young people are constantly traumatized so they can't concentrate on school because they worry about how to get home safe, or how to walk down the street and be safe, and they preoccupied with this. This is why a lot of people are getting high off drugs. It's why people are transferring that aggression and this fear on each other, right? But when it comes to guys like myself that's been through this and, and did some healing, you know, I'm a, he a wounded healer, and I can get with somebody, help them make that transition themselves, like I was offering to the brother here, we run into these blocks. So we need the community to say, hey, lead them, sister, because it's sisters too, it's better the sisters come out of prison. You know, because of her background, her conviction, when she come home, somebody had in her, her children. But then the, the, the laws say because of her conviction, she can't get Section 8. She can't get subsidized housing. She can't get public aid for her children because of her conviction. And she the one really needed. <laughs> so they set up these barriers. You know, this is called invisible punishment. You know, the punishment you don't see in the courtroom. And they're not going to advise you when you take this conviction, this is what you're going to be faced upon your release. That's invisible punishment. Then you got collateral consequences, you know, you commit a state offense and go to a state prison, but you punish federally, deny federal benefits. See, So these are the kind of things that people uh, like you can do, become conscious, become aware, share with your neighbors, especially around voting time. You need to he listen who's uh, 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 friendly to those incarcerated because uh, I've been incarcerated, but it had an impact on my little brother that was denied a relationship with me because I was locked up. I was incarcerated, but it had an impact on my mother who worried about me when I was locked up. So their families is impacted. When I did a bit, they did a bit. When I fell, they fell. I got frustrated, they got frustrated. <laughs> they broke promises to themselves about me, I broke promises to myself. See, so we all impacted by this here. You know, this is why our organization, all of us are deputy registrars. And I uh, advise brothers and sisters, because we work with sisters too, to go back on those blocks, those corners, and register their homies that are still out there getting high, register them to vote. Because we need to develop a strong voting block. You know, 
So when election time comes, they ain't worried about how the gay community going to vote or how the Hispanics going to vote or how the blacks going to vote. They need to worry about how these ex-cons going to vote. And until we get there, we might as well sit down and stop complaining.